I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, I welcome you into this uh, evening presentation, where this is number 11 in the series, The Prophets and the Messengers, and this is number two of three in this uh, topic, uh, verbal inspiration or thought inspiration. And so I just want to welcome us that uh, the Lord may speak to us and above all that uh, we may be enlightened in the things of heaven. So shall we pray as uh, we commence uh, our nightly presentation? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, glory and honor be unto thy name. Thank you for giving us opportunity once again that we may share. And Lord, help us to learn together. May the spirit that guided thy messengers and prophets in the past continue guiding us. Outpour thy spirit upon us, Lord, that we may represent thee in truth and in spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And so in the number 10, which was one in this topic of uh, verbal inspiration or thought inspiration, we looked at a few things, uh, both uh, in canonical and non-canonical uh, uh, messengers of the Lord and uh, the things that uh, may seem uh, inaccurate or creating some discrepancy. And uh, today I just want to continue with this issue. Uh, how do we uh, view the prophets uh, when they speak to us? Is it uh, a verbal inspiration or a, a thought inspiration? So looking, continuing where we left. Uh, and the issue of lesser light versus the greater light, I went through it at some length. And so I'll just pass over it. But uh, th this is what uh, I like to say as uh, we, we go through this. Um, E.G. White herself said that a little heed is given to the Bible and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. And this you can go into a previous presentations and you shall be able to um, see what we had to present on that. In fact, uh, uh, just that was in uh, presentation or uh, number four in the series, Prophets and Messengers. We'll be able to see uh, a full presentation on uh, the lesser light versus the greater light. But I, I like to say this. In uh, early 1903, Ellen White burdened about the decline in Kolpotua work and literature evangelism, wrote an article for the review. She wrote an article for the review. And uh, in that article, she expressed appreciation for the successful promotion of Christ object um, lesson. She also wrote, Sister White is not the originator of these books. They contain the precious, comforting light that God has graciously given his servant to be given to the world. From their pages, this light is to shine into the hearts of men and women, leading them to the Savior. And so she understood that um, even though she were uh, the messenger of the Lord, the people were to be led ultimately to the author and uh, finisher of our faith and not to be led uh, to herself. Then uh, she amplified uh, this connection between God's light and her writings and where her writings as all other prophetic writings will lead readers. She said the Lord has sent his people much instruction line upon line, precept upon precept, um, here a little and there a little, little heed is given to the Bible and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. And then quoting uh, Herbert Douglas, uh, this is what he say in the messenger of the Lord. This is what um, Herbert Douglas has to say in the messenger of uh, 
the Lord. Sorry for that. Yes. How about Douglas uh, gives uh, us this uh, in her larger context, Miss White seems to be referring to how all biblical prophets are lesser lights leading their uh, people to the Savior. Leading people to their Savior. The light of the world in John 8, 12, 9, 5, and 12, 4, 6. Even as John the Baptist came to bear witness of that light, in John 1, 7 and 8, because people in her day were giving little heed to the Bible, which was to lead people to Christ, the light of the world, the Lord spoke to her as a lesser light, even as John the Baptist and all other biblical prophets were lesser lights to lead people to Christ, the greater light. And so she realized this concept that um, actually she was uh, not the light, but Christ himself was the light. And all messengers of the Lord, both uh, uh, canonical and non-canonical, their ultimate goal is to lead people to Christ and not uh, uh, lead people to the, themselves, not lead people to uh, actually themselves. From uh, another point of view, no one can question that Ellen White regarded the Bible itself as a greater light with its centuries of inspired writings and its gold standard acceptance as the word of God. Numerous are the references from her earliest days to her last that exalted the Bible, such as the Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of his, of, uh, uh, his God's will. There are the standard of character, the reveal of doctrines, and the test of her uh, experience. She saw clearly the relationship of her writing to the Bible. They were not only to exalt the Bible, they were to attract minds to it, to call attention to the words of inspiration, which uh, people had neglected to obey, and to impress vividly upon them heart uh, the truth already revealed, to awaken and impress the mind that all may be left without excuse, to bring out general principles and to come down to them, uh, minute uh, 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 principles and specifications of life according to how they understood what the Lord was himself speaking unto them. But uh, sometimes we ask ourselves, what did E.G. White mean when she said that her writings were less alike? And uh, there are people who have viewed these things in three metaphors. Uh, uh, the testing instrument and that which is tested. And uh, I want just to read something uh, about um, how it has been categorized into three metaphors. When she, what does she mean when she says that her writing are, are less light and uh, uh, this is uh, what uh, Herbert Douglas has to say about this. I'm quoting from the Messenger of Light, and uh, I pro uh, I I, uh, I recommend that uh, we can be able to read uh, the book. He says, displayed in the National Bureau of Standards at uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland, is the National prototype meter number 27, which was the national reference for line measurement from 1893 until 1960. It is made of 90% platinum and 10% iridium. Today, the national standard is measured by an even more accurate method uh, involving light emitted by electrically excited atoms of crypto krypton 86. If anyone is unsure about his yardstick, he or she may take it to the national standard for comparative analysis. The application is obvious. The national standard is the greater light. Copies of this national standard called working standard are industrial tools requiring exact precision and accuracy that meet the standard of the greater light would be lesser light. Yet for all practical purposes, these copies function as well as the standard. A prototype standard great light exists by which all other measures, lesser lights are tested. 
but the local hardware yardstick lesser light is no less faithful to its task than the greater light if it has passed the test. Thus, the reliability of the yardstick is for all practical purposes the same as the platinum iridium bar in Gaithersburg, Maryland. So that is the group number one, the testing, how people viewed when she said her writings were lesser light, the testing instrument and that which is tested. Number two, uh, the comparison of 40 candles with one candle. The analogy here is that the Bible was written by about 40 authors, 40 candles. Ellen White is one candle. Thus, the Bible is the greater light. Both the greater light and the lesser light gave sufficient light to dispel darkness. The quality of light in the greater light is the same as that of the lesser light. Then we have uh, the national map and the state maps. Many road atlases have a two-page map of the 48 contiguous states followed by the state maps. The national map with its coast-to-coast -coast display of the interstate highway system is the greater light. The state maps, though, possessing more detail are the lesser light. Each has it is special function. Both the greater and the lesser light have equal authority in presenting uh, the uh, truth. And uh, also we have uh, what um, we may call the telescope analogy, the telescope analogy. Now in the telescope analogy, Miss uh, S. M. I. Henry, well known in the late 19th century as a leader in the Women's Christian Temperance Union, became a Seventh Day Adventist while a uh, patient at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. She and Ellen White soon developed a close friendship, largely because of their common life experiences. One of Miss Henry's challenges was to present the Sabbath truth to her friends in. Uh, WCTU, that is Women uh, 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 Temperance Union, especially because they were often the leaders in promoting some legislation. However, accepting a prophet in the Adventist church was not easy for Miss Henry. After close study, she saw the role of Ellen White to be akin to a telescope through which to look at the Bible. Miss Henry described her new insight in an article for January 1898 issue of God of Good Health. And this is what she said, and uh, we are quoting from um, Messenger of the Lord, page 408 to 409. The book is written by Herbert Douglas, but quoting different people and uh, writers and authors and pioneers who had some information or who had something to speak about E.G. White. So Miss um, Henry said this about E.G. White. Everything depends upon our relation to it telescope and the use which you make of it. In itself, it is only a glass through which to look, but in the hand of the divine director, properly mounted, set at the right angle and adjusted to the eye of the observer with a field clear of clouds, it will reveal truths such as will quicken the blood, gladden the heart and open a wide door of expectations. It will reduce nebula to constellations, far away points of light to planets of the first magnitude. The failure has been in understanding what the testimonies are and how to use them. They are not the heavens palpitating with countless orbs of truth, but they do lead the eye and give it power to penetrate into the glories of the mysterious living word of God. Ellen White saw this article and asked permission to have it republished in Australia. She thought that Miss Henry had captured the relationship between the Bible and her work as clearly and as accurately as anyone could ever put into words. For Miss White, the Bible was always, always the greater light from which she derived her theological principles. And uh, so looking at um, what Miss uh, Miss Henry had to say, and this is what I have been repeating that um, the writings of E.G. White has to be taken in a way that uh, people will find themselves an interest to the Bible, not find an interest in E.G. White per se, but find an interest in, uh, um, in exploring the word of God and understanding what he is speaking, uh, what God is speaking to his people. 
and more so that uh, the glimpses she gives of the things which are hidden behind stories are uh, really to ignite and propel our minds to search more of this minefield which is hidden with the treasures uh, untold of. And so the writings of E.G. White do not replace the Bible. They are not placed side by the side by the Bible. But um, because people do not appreciate the reading of the Bible, God has seen it fit to give them line upon line, precept upon precept, uh, uh, his word. But because they do not heed unto it, he has given a lesser light, which is to lead to the greater light. And so sometimes we talk about um, the degrees of inspiration, canonical versus canonical. You know, that is what, always what we do. When you are talking about canonical prophets, what is their degrees of inspiration? When we are talking about non-canonical prophets, what is the degrees of their inspiration? Uh, at least eight prophets mentioned in the Bible wrote for their times, but their works were not included in the canon. The biblical story not only does not hint of any difference in the quality of their inspiration, it describes their work as uh, of equally authority with the canonical prophets. We find no difference in how they received their messages or in how they communicated them and how their contemporaries responded to them. Non-canonical prophets spoke for God and were regarded as God's spokesman for their contemporaries. But I want just to raise one issue. Think about um, even the office of the prophets and uh, what people especially look at when they hear the word the prophet. This must be a person who is having visions and dreams, some mysterious things which cannot be understood, can be able to form some miraculous and mysterious uh, uh, things. But then take that view of the prophet and uh, put here Elijah and put on the other side John the Baptist. Now it is interesting why I choose these two, Elijah on one side and uh, John the Baptist on one side. Elijah is, I can say, the, uh, the greatest prophet ever to rise in Israel. He feared nothing, and he stood against idolatry in its highest sense, even though people may point at him running away from Jezebel. But this is one of the greatest prophets to ever be. You may say Moses and all that stuff, but um, when you talk about prophets, one of the people that comes directly into the mind is Elijah and his miraculous workings in his time. Take, the, take then John the Baptist. This is a cool guy in the wilderness just preaching a message of repentance and holiness, no miracles and all that miraculous stuff, visions and dreams. He is just a, an evangelist there, a, a layman, you can say, that uh, you may not find in the offices of uh, uh, the spiritual gifts in the Bible. Uh, you, you wouldn't put him anywhere in that office. But when Jesus Christ comes, says, of all the prophets have, that have ever risen, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. Now, that is something. Yet he did no, he did no miracle. This guy had no visions and dreams. He was just preaching a message of uh, repentance in the wilderness. But he is the ever mightiest prophet to be ever, or the greatest prophet to ever rise in Israel. And so, and uh, John says that uh, the Jewish believe that before the great day of the Lord, Elijah must come. And he says, if you believe so, then Elijah has come and they did not recognize him. And he points to John the Baptist. And so here is John the Baptist. He is the Elijah. And Elijah did a lot of miracles. He has not done any miracle. And then he, he, he doesn't have that said the Lord like Elijah. But here he is a man who is mightier than Elijah. So when we are talking about uh, degrees of inspiration, what people look into actually may be the wrong things to be looking into. With the suggestion that some prophets were granted a higher degree of revelation, inspiration than other prophets, comes the inescapable question. Who will decide that this prophet had a greater degree of inspiration and this one here never had 
a greater degree of inspiration. And I have just given you an example of Elijah and John the Baptist. And so who will say that uh, because a prophet was not canonic, canonical, then uh, he was, uh, or they were not canonical, then they are not uh, having the highest uh, uh, degree of inspiration. Who is to decide such a question? Can an inspired person sit in judgment on a prophet's work and decide whether he or she is a first, second, or a third degree prophet? The gift of prophecy as other spiritual gifts is given to men and women according to his own will, according to Hebrews 2, 4, not man's will. And in, uh, in the year 1884, the president of the General Conference George I. Butler attempted to contribute to a clear understanding of this subject by authoring 10 articles for the church paper. Uh, in these articles, he discussed differences in degrees of inspiration. And uh, I just uh, want to uh, uh, bring something on the screen that um, we may be able to share together. And so Ellen White, just uh, at the bottom of the page, Ellen White waited five years to respond, hoping that he would catch his own mistake. Uh, after George G.I. Butler attempted to contribute to a clear understanding of this subject by authoring 10 articles for the church paper, Ellen White waited five years to respond, hoping that he would catch his own mistake. But when others began to pick up on Butler's point of view and teach it in Battle Creek College, she wrote, both in the Battle Creek Tabernacle and in the college, the subject of inspiration has been taught. And finite men have taken it upon themselves to say that some things in the scripture were inspired and some were not. I was shown that the Lord did not inspire the articles on inspiration published in the review, neither did he approve their endorsement before our youth in the college. When men venture to criticize the word of God, they venture on sacred holy ground and had better fear and tremble and hide their wisdom as foolishness. God sets no man to pronounce judgment on his word, selecting some things as inspired and discrediting others as in, un, uninspired. The testimonies have been treated in the same way, but God is not in this. That is uh, what she had to talk about, the articles that um, G.I. Butler was producing in the uh, review. Writing on the writings are the product of inspiration or they are not. Prophets are genuine or they are imposters. Other than the difference between the common and the sacred, which should be obvious to everyone, no one is able to divide a prophet's writing into mm -hmm. the inspired and the less inspired. As soon as one tries, the final arbiter is human reason. Each person then believes that his own reason is more dependable than uh, anyone's else. And so, uh, although People try to uh, uh, or attempt to do such a things, and uh, you will even find uh, people talking about um, the greater prophets and the lesser prophets in the Bible. And it is deemed those who wrote little, those last last books you find in the Old Testament, they are called lesser prophets. And then those who had these voluminous writings, they are called greater prophets. And uh, I was made to understand why that thing is done like so in that um, um the the people uh try to imagine that um those who had uh, many visions or uh, had many writings are the greater prophets they are deemed greater because of the larger uh amount of information that they wrote and the others are called lesser, not because they are less, but because they had uh, little information that they give. So it is not about, um, uh, I was made to understand, it's not about them being lesser or greater, but what is deemed as greater or lesser is the amount of the information they contributed to the Bible. Through the years, some have just suggested that Ellen's white articles in periodicals were not as inspired as her books or uh, that her letters were not inspired, only her published books. In 1882, she wrote a candid letter on slighting the testimonies to be read in the Battle Creek, Michigan church. And uh, she said, now when I send you a testimony of warning and reproof, many of you declare it to be merely the opinion of Sister White. You have there by inserted the spirit of God. You know 
how the Lord has manifested himself through the spirit of prophecy. This has been my work for many years. A power has impelled me to reprove and rebuke wrongs that I had not thought of. Is this work of the last 30 years from above or from beneath? Uh, and uh, this really burdened her. And uh, in some places you find that uh, she wrote when she was writing the letter, uh, she says that it is the spirit of God that prompted me. It was not my own uh, will or doing to write unto you. And so the suggestions that uh, prophets can be categorized by degrees of authority is similar to the previous discussion of differences in degrees of uh, inspiration that has been there in the past that are going on right now. And um, how do we uh, correspond with canonical writings and non-canonical writings. And uh, such appeals to divide inspiration into degrees uh, means that the person who is doing that has a higher authority and a higher office than the one that they are talking about. And so if today I'll rise up to speak about degrees of inspiration and start classifying this prophet into this category and this prophet into this category. It means my office is higher than the one that I'm really categorizing. And so sometimes this proposed categorizing of prophets rests on the difference between canonical and non-canonical prophets. Non-canonical prophets are considered pastoral inspiration. Canonical prophets are considered as authoritative and their word final. But um, non-canonical prophets, their word is not final. It can be altered. It can be de debunked or uh, uh, let me not use the word debunked, but um, um, let me use the word ignored. And so try out that reasoning in the Bible story. How much authority did David believe Nathan had when he talked on with him on uh, building the Lord's house, when Nathan came to him and told him what he had to tell him? And how did Nathan understand his role, inspiration or authoritative? The Lord sent Nathan to David in 2 Samuel 12.1. Later, David, a canonical prophet, had a similar experience with another non-canonical prophet, God, David's seer, in 1 Chronicle 21.9. Again, the non-canonical prophet was conscious of his authority. God came to David and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, 1 Chronicles 21.11. Father, so David went up to the, up at the word of God, of God, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord, in 1 Chronicle 21.19. This is a non-canonical prophet coming to David, David, who also is a type of a messiah, and he was called a prophet too. In his last sermon, um, the late associate of review editor, Don F. Neufeld, said, through his witness to the New Testament prophet, Jesus predicted that prophetic activity as one of many spiritual gifts will continue in the church. In other words, the testimony of Jesus to his people was to not cease once the books that made up the scripture were written. Think about this. The gift of prophecy is to continue in the church until the end of the age. And uh, what is the use of this gift? I want us to go to the scriptures and see the use of this gift among other gifts. Uh, in the book of uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse, um, verse uh, 11 downwards. Let us see what the word of the Lord says. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, one for perfecting the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Three things. Till we come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto perfect man, unto the full stature and measure, full measure 
and of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now look at verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. I want you to think about this for a moment. Let me highlight it. That um, the work of these gifts are to continue in the church until the end. And they are for perfecting the saint, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and to settle people in truth both spiritually and intellectually so that they may not be tossed here and there with winds of doctrines, which means these gifts will continue to define the doctrines of the church as long as they exist and probation has not closed. I want that to sink in because we are told that non-canonical prophets, their work is pastoral and inspiration, and it's not doctrinal. It cannot be authoritative as the canonical prophets. But here we have these gifts continuing until the close of probation, until Christ is seen in the clouds of the air. And they are to settle the people into truth, both spiritual and intellectual, so that they may not be tossed about with winds of doctrines. Meaning, as authoritative is the canonical word on doctrine, so is the non-canonical prophet or messenger when it comes to doctrine. Because if we say they are only inspiration, and pastoral, then it means doctrine ceases once the Bible writers closes the writing of the scriptures. And then when we come to the non-canonical prophets, then we can enter into this delusion of degrees of inspiration and say, now this is not authoritative, but it is only um, for pastoral and for inspiration. Onward, since the Bible was written, there are no other doctrines or light on the doctrine that has to be shed forth because these writings of non-canonical prophets are not being added in the Bible. But you see how there is a logical fallacy that uh, the non-canonical prophets are only for inspiration and for pastoral cases. We are told these gifts after the Bible has been written, until the end of the age, they will still continue to be in charge. And they are to make the people stand into truth, both spiritually and intellectually, so that they may be not tossed here and there by winds of doctrines, which means the non-canonical prophets will be able to define doctrines too. I want that to sink in for a minute because we have arguments that uh, non-canonical prophets cannot be a uh, uh, authority to doctrines. And so look at what Herbert Douglas poses now then. This brings us to an important question. If in all prophetic activity it is Jesus who is speaking, whether in Old Testament times, in New Testament times or in the post-New Testament times, can we logically draw a distinction and say that what Jesus said in any one period is more or less authoritative than what he said in any other period? For example, could something that Jesus said in the first century AD be, of, be more or less authoritative than what he said in the 19th century AD? The answer, I think, is obvious. It doesn't make any sense to argue for degrees of inspiration as if what Jesus, through the spirit of prophecy, said in one generation was more inspired than what he said in another. When uh, Joshua, when Josiah 60, 621 BC recognized the long lost scriptures, probably Deuteronomy, and we can see that in 2 Chronicles 34 14, he trembled at the impending judgment or told on God's people as a consequence of apostasy. He was perplexed as to whether 
he and his leaders had enough time to institute national reform. His loyal religious leaders, Shapan, the scholar, Hilkiah, the high priest, and many teaching levites were equally troubled. They all wanted to know the meaning of the scripture that promised both doom and blessing. Where did they turn for counsel to the prophetess Hulda? Josiah appreciated and respected his uh, committed scholars and religious counselors. These trusted leaders were illuminated by the spirit of God, but they too with Josiah needed a high authority to explain what the scriptures had meant in Moses' day and what they should mean in their day. For that authority, they turned to the prophetess. Josiah and his counselors recognized that the authority of a message is derived from its source. They perceived the same divine source in both the Bible and in the message of contemporary prophet. In comparing Hulda and Ellen White, we note that both intensified the importance of the written word, both focused the word on current situation, both exalted the scriptures, and both attracted the people to apply the Bible to their lives leading reform. Messenger of the Lord, page 411 to 412. And so here you have a case of uh, Hulda who uh, is not a uh, uh, canonical prophetess. And uh, another issue that we uh, have is uh, uh, then uh, to what extent should we deem their messages uh, right or false? Now, this is a very simple thing to answer. And there is no other place we can head unless it is testing the non-canonical prophet with the Bible itself. And I'll just give one scripture in passing. To the law and to the testimony. And we are talking about the testimony of others who are before this non-canonical prophet. If they do not speak according to this word, there is no light in them. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. And no prophet will arise to undo another prophet of God which was before them. And so, um, are prophets infallible, by the way? Sometimes we ask such a thing. Um, and there are, are their words, uh, as we are seeing verbal or thought inspiration, are their words not subject to being understood in a better language? Is it as it is in the print, that is the end of it. All prophets use their own language, imperfect as all human language is and always will be. Prophets use the language of their own family, community, and time. As the years go by, through study and travel, they improve their ability to understand and present God's message. The growth in perception and communicative skills make their prophetic role um, more effective. And uh, at this point, I, I just want to Let's quote something from E.G. White, how she says that God actually works with uh, the prophets or um, both um, canonical and uh, non-canonical. Uh, and uh, I'd like to refer, I'd like to read from uh, Selected Messages, book, book one, page uh, 21 from paragraph one, so that uh, we may understand some things in their context. When we are talking about verbal inspiration versus thought inspiration. Here she says, the Bible is written by inspired men, but it's not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God as a writer is not represented. Men will often say such an and such an expression is not like God. But God has not put himself in words, in logic, in rhetoric, on, tri on trial in the Bible. The writers of the Bible were God's penmen, not his pen. Look at the different writers. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired. Inspiration acts not on the man's words or his expressions, but on the man himself, who under the influence of the Holy Ghost is imbued with thoughts. But the words receive the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind is diffused. The divine mind 
and will is combined with the human mind and will. Thus, the utterances of man are the word of God. And so, this is what uh, we are saying. All prophets use their own language, imperfect as all human language is and always will be. Prophets use the language of their own family, community, and time. As the years go by, through study and travel, they improve their ability to understand and present God's messages. This growth in perception and communicative skills make their prophetic role even more effective. Think about this for a moment also that um, the scriptures which we are saying that they are inspiration is a Jewish book. The Bible is a Jewish book, whether you like it or not. Even Jesus asserted this thing that salvation belongs to the Jewish. You worship you, which you don't know, but we worship what we know. And so that, that was not to cast a demeanor or uh, to throw a content upon Gentiles. No, there is a truth, whether you like it or you don't like it. The Bible is a Jewish book. And salvation is for the Jewish. They worship what they know. We Gentiles, we are just trying to understand God in the context of what was given to the Jewish. Does it mean that they are privileged? And to some extent they are because they understand their own language better. Someone may say, if they understood their language better, why did they crucify Jesus Christ? That is none of our business, by the way. You should ask yourself, am I walking in the will of God? But they have the preeminence as the, uh, uh, um, uh, what, what word can I use? Those who receive the oracles of God, the repositories of the truth, or the repositories of that word. So this is a Jewish text being tried to be understood by any other people. And the people who are writing wrote with a Jewish background. You cannot say the feasts actually as the Jewish uh, a, a writer put them, Moses himself, they are they can be compared to the climate of other places in the world. No way. Th that the feasts actually fail in the climate or and uh, the, the, the agricultural system of Israel. But there are um, a model that can be used in a wild world scale and um, not bring error to the scriptures which were handed to them. And so uh, the issue is verbal or thought inspiration. And God communicates to the prophets and their work is to write down what they have received in a way that whoever shall read it, whether it is from their community or not from their community, can understand the text and find his savior in that text. But prophets are not perfect. They make mistakes. Sometimes they have faulty memories. Sometimes they make a slip of the tongue lapses linquere. Sometimes they misuse grammar. When Matthew wrote Jeremiah instead of Zechariah, when he found an Old Testament analogy to Judas 30 pieces of silver in Matthew 27, 9 uh, and 10, Jeremiah 2, 6, 9 and Zechariah 11, 12, he made a mistake of memory or lapse of thought. In a similar fashion, Ellen White attributed to Peter the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ constrained in us, the apostle Peter declared. This was the motive that impelled the zealous disciple in the arduous uh, labors in the course of the gospel. And so they are not superhuman computers per se. The Holy Spirit corrects the prophets when they are cancelled for whatever reason may uh, adversely affect their work. Not how Nathan was told to change his counsel to David in 2 Samuel 7, and when Ellen White changed her counsel regarding the closing of the Southern Publishing Association. Um, but uh, the Holy Spirit does not correct the prophet's human finiteness in the use of their communication skills. Messenger of the Lord, page 412, 412, paragraph 5. Revelation in the work of God as he speaks to the prophet. Inspiration describes the many ways God works through the prophets in conveying his message to people. Biblical prophets and Ellen White have used at least six models of inspiration. And this is what uh, I want us to look at, the six models of uh, inspiration. First, we have the visionary model. Most often, we connect prophets with visions and dreams, but God also has revealed himself in what we call theophanies, in which the actual presence of a heavenly being is seen or heard. We think of Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, 4, and Joshua before Jericho, Joshua 5, 13 to 15. 
On another occasion, the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, Elisha's associate, and he saw the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, 2 Kings 6, 15, 17, and that is Gehazi, I believe. Often, visions and dreams are so graphic that the prophet has difficulty distinguishing them from normal reality. Uh, Isaiah confidently could say, I saw the Lord. I heard the voice of the Lord in Isaiah 6, 1 and 8. Ellen White had many visions and dreams where the reality of the dream vision experience overwhelm her as did for Daniel or Ezekiel. So one of uh, the models of inspiration is visionary model where you find the prophet say that I was carried into this in, in the spirit. The second model uh, is witness model. God at times prompted certain biblical writers to give their own account of what they had seen and heard. John exemplifies this model when he wrote 1 John 1.1 1, 1, to 3, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. The Gospels of Matthew and John are examples of the witness model. They did not need a vision to write out their messages. Here, the Holy Spirit was using a different kind of model of inspiration in addition to the vision dream model. Ellen White wrote many pages reflecting this witness model. Her words in a such a, a mode are a qualitatively inspired as a writing that were prompted by dream or vision. Historian model, that is number three. Luke and Mark did not write their gospel after receiving dreams and visions. Neither were they witnesses to the revelation as Matthew and John. Mark, it is generally agreed, depended largely on Peter's witness. But Mark was not an eyewitness. He was a faithful historian. Luke candidly describes his method of telling the gospel story in his preface addressed to Theophilus. In, some, in, in as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a, narrat a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the fa very first to write to you an orderly account most excellent Theophilus that you may know the certainty the certainty of those things in which you are instructed Luke 1 uh, chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 thus in uh, in the historian model God expects his messengers to use all pertinent historical records oral or written to fill up the message God provides the message and helps the messengers find the suitable material to make the message understandable to their readers. As we discovered uh, in the earlier pages, certain parts of the New Testament were imported from extra biblical sources. These secular and non-biblical sources came, became part of the inspired message. And you can go to the previous presentation, that is uh, number 10, and you'll find so much information uh, on this issue of a historical model. Counselor model, this is um, number four. Some of Paul's letters, such as those to Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and portions of the Corinthian letters are classic letters of Christian counsel. None of these letters is so liturgical. In 1 Corinthians 7, we find a mix of vision, truth, and inspired counsel. In verse 10, Paul said, Now to the married, I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. In verse 25, he followed with this counsel. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. In verse 40, he reminded the child that the, wife's, the wife is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, and I think also I have the Spirit of God. If someone would suggest that vision counsel inspire, is inspired and non vision counsel is not, we will be dividing what Paul never did. What part of the Timothy letters is more inspired than the other parts? Paul will say, I have the spirit of God. And uh, then we have an uh, uh, epistolary model. But uh, before that, a large part of Ellen White's testimonies will be classified as counsel from one who had the spirit of God. Just um, as even Paul says that I have the spirit of God. Um, this does not always mean that she had a special vision for a specific concept. In her years of receiving vision, she had developed a keen sense of rightness and propriety. 
Her collected inspired wisdom gave her a rich store from which to draw even as Paul would do in writing this counsel to individuals and to churches. Whether transmitting judgments derived from a vision or counsel based on years of listening to God, both communication came from one mind inspired by the same spirit. A episto epistolary model, that is number five. Letters to congregations and individuals, the most common method used by New Testament writers. Some of the letters were private, others were meant to be read publicly. It seems most probable that Paul never thought that the, his letters to Philemon, Timothy, and Titus would become public. But we are thankful that they did. In these letters, we see a mix of common matters with obviously spiritual counsel and instruction. These New Testament letters help us understand better how to relate to Ellen White's many letters that often were private and frequently mixed the common with the sacred. If the Lord permitted Paul's private letters to be included in the canon for universal distribution, it will be appropriate to believe that the letters of this of his modern prophet might also bring encouragement and corrective counsel to those who do not have the benefit of her personal, personal ministry. And then we have lastly the literary model. When we go, when we are talking about uh, the models of inspiration, not the degrees of inspiration. Literary model. The Bible contains portions such as the Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes where the writer expresses his most intimate feelings through poetry and prose. Again, it seems improbable that David or the other psalmist thought that their songs will eventually be in print and circulated the world over. Their deepest emotions, elation, as well as anxiety flow like an artisan well. In God's wisdom, these human emotions were meant to be preserved for the benefit of all who struggle in their daily lives. And so, although Ellen White was not a poet, she also expressed her keenest emotions in thousands of diary pages. We are reminded of the Apostle's words in Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, that God has at various times and in different ways spoken to us throughout human history. In listening to David or Ellen White, we, or Ellen White, we often hear our own cries of anxiety, even discouragement, as well as our joy. And... Uh, Sometimes you have just to look at um, the letters of E.G. White to uh, the son, uh, Edison. And uh, my friend, you will understand the cry of a mother and how to deal with children. And you will find comfort in that. And so her letters, and I'm not saying that uh, all her letters and all her diary and biography are inspired that one i dealt with it that common matters may be, are, are, are spoken of business transactions are spoken of and so and so on and these are not visions there's the errors of common days and that is not to discount that uh, somebody uh, is not a prophet and so uh when are we supposed then to quote her and this um we went uh we, we, we tackle much of this in um, uh, number six in the series, The Prophet and uh, the Messengers. And number six was the framework and uses, usage of E.G. White materials. How do you use her? And uh, number seven, we looked at should E.G. White materials be used as a test of fellowship. You can revisit that because uh, I won't spend time on this, but when are we supposed to quote E.G. White. And uh, I'd like just to quote Herbert uh, Douglas because we read what E.G. White herself say, said about herself and quoting her. But let us uh, see what Herbert Douglas says on this point. He says, in the Messenger of the Lord, one of the most important lessons to be learned from the 1888 experience is that Ellen White was more concerned with leaving the truth than in discussing it. She made that clear on many occasions. If an unchrist like spirit motivated a Bible student that suggested for her that there might be something wrong with his, her theology. Another emotionally laden event occurred the day before the 1901 General Conference session in Battle Creek. Many were the challenges that the delegates faced, but uh, probably the greatest was the need to reorganize the General Conference, which for many years, 
involve only a few leaders with too much authority. Ellen White called it a king-like, kingly ruling power. Close to this uh, root problem, the leaders had to face the enormous denominational debt, the amount and kind of commercial printing being done at the Revy and Herald Publishing House and the growing contention with Dr. Kellogg. Yet underneath all these visible problems flowed a stream of inertia to change. This inertia not only resisted improved policies of church governance, it also resisted openness to present truth and to a deepening of spiritual attitudes. Ellen White reminded the leaders of her counsel she had been giving them for years. Enough has been said over and over and over again, but it did not make any difference. The light shone upon them just the same, professedly accepting it, but they did not make any change. That is what frightens me. The root of this spiritual problem was that Miss White counsel, though often used, was misapplied to suit one point of view, and the principles were ignored. He, God, wants you to eat his principles, to live his principles, but those that are there, now present church leaders, never will be, will appreciate it. They have had their taste, they have had their warnings, and now they must be a change. So Ellen White wanted no more lip service to her counsel. Lay Sister White right to one side. Do not, you, do not you ever quote my words again as long as you live until you can obey the Bible. When you take the Bible and make that your food and uh, make that the elements of your character, when you can do that, you will know better how to receive some counsel from God. But here is the word exalted before you today and do not you give her up anymore what Sister White said. Uh, Sister White said this and Sister White said that. And Sister White said the other thing, but say, thus said the Lord God of Israel, and then you do just what the Lord God of Israel does and what he said. So she wanted the church leaders to leave out the principles of the gospel, not to hide behind quotations from her, as if meeting some of her counsel on church work could make up for their lack of Christian character. Her many testimonies regarding the seamless union of medical missional work with the ministry had been generally ignored. Her counsel regarding the relationship of the mind and the healthy body had also been largely disregarded. In um, 1901 setting, uh, in, the, in this 1901 setting at Battle Creek, Ellen White was not discussing the relationship of her writing in the development of doctrine when she said, Father, do not you quote Sister White. I do not want you ever to quote Sister White until you get some, get your vantage ground where you know where you are. Quote the Bible, talk the Bible, it's full of meat. Carry it out in your life and you will know more Bible than you know. Now, and I ask you to put on the armor every piece of it and be sure that your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel. She was simply telling these church leaders that appeals to her writings for whatever purpose was missing the mark when they were not generally speaking, internalizing the principles of the gospel found either in the Bible or in her writings. Leaving the gospel was more important than playing church, no matter how many question, quotations about the gospel were in their head. Now, this uh, is a very important thing to talk about. Sister White, it's not wrong to quote Sister White, although she said, lay her aside. But then it will be so wrong to quote her to justify yourself in any way, shape, or form. He says, leave out the Bible. That is the very important thing. By the way, we misuse her writing so much when we think it is to settle scores amongst ourselves. The purpose of the writings, whether they be canonical or non-canonical, is to live a pious life, to live a Christian life, not to uh, use the Bible or the writings as a sledge hammer on other people. That is why she says, do not quote me. If we quote Sister White, both in church and outside the church, and we are li li living like devils, what you are doing is making of her writings of none effect. If I say I'm a friend of, let me take an example of my wife, Remy Wilberforce. If I say that, I'm a friend of Remy Wilberforce. Then somebody finds me that uh, I'm a thief, I'm a robber, I'm a murderer. Then 
my character will not remain with me alone. My character will be extended to the person that I associate myself with or I recognize myself with. So if I'm saying that uh, I'm a friend of so-and-so, then my character should go before the so-and-so. And when people see my character, then they can readily accept the person I'm saying I'm identified with. I, I hope we understand each other well. The issue is not quoting Sister White or quoting the Bible. The reason why people have rejected the Bible, and uh, this was even written by Paul in the book of um, Romans, and uh, I'll, I'll just bring the verse on the board right away. Uh, in the book of Romans, this is what Paul, Paul says. Uh, in Romans chapter 2, verses uh, 19 to 29, I I'll read this because it is important to me to illustrate what I'm illustrating. Romans chapter 2 from uh, verse 19, and at and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal. Thou that saith a man should, commit, should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery. Thou that abhorreth idols, dost thou commit sacrilege. Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law dishonoreth the thou god now look at this point clearly thou that makest thy boast of the law through the breaking the law dishonorest not thou god you see paul he, here is giving a fact if we say we are christians and then we live a life that is not a Christian life, then we bring dishonor to Christ, whom we take the name from and whom we call. And so if we quote Sister White and we are living contrary to the truth revealed in her writing, we make people readily reject her rather than accept her. Like uh, th there is no way when people will look at us and they find that we have a high spirit, we have this character that is unworthwhile, and they say, oh, this is the, 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 the spirit of their prophet. Because they are quoting from that prophet, then that is the spirit of that prophet. So whatsoever, it's not wrong to quote her. But if you don't have a character fit for heaven, then you make her writings of none effect. That, just as the Paul has said, if thou boast in the law, and thou breakest the law, thou dishonoreth the God of that law. And that is how we misuse even E.G. White's writing and other people's writing. And then uh, Paul has this to say in uh, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keepest the law. But if thou be a break of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter in circumcision does transgress the law? Very interesting. For it's not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but God. And I can paraphrase and say this, that uh, actually those who don't have the Bible, when they do the things of the Bible, they are a law unto themselves, and they will despise you, you who say that you have the Bible and you cannot keep the law. They will readily go to heaven, but you have heard the Bible all these days will not. Those who say that we have a prophet, a messenger among us, as it is on my right side, you can see that. And yet, they do not reflect the character of a prophet or a messenger. What shall it be a prophet to them? The people who do not have a messenger or a prophetess or whoever, they are privileged 
than those who have a prophetess whom they only quote at their convenience to beat others like a hammer on the nail and nothing else. And so while we talk about when should we quote Sister White, I say we can quote Sister White in our character. When our character are not right, then we identify how she is a false messenger. When our character are right, then we can identify fully correctly with her writing. So today you may say you are not going to quote her, but since you have been professing about it and your character is filthy, then you are still identified with a false prophet. But if your character is leading you to cite the word of the Lord, piousness, and in, get involved in having a personal relationship with God, then it can be identified these are the effects of the message from their messenger. They are Christ-like. Mahatma Gandhi says, I do not like your Christianity. I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christianity. You can think about that. May it not be said of us like that. And uh, as we just bring this to a close, um, E.G. White herself in her writings stated that the Bible was given for practical purposes. She urged her readers to join her in taking the Bible just as it is, as the inspired word, and that in obeying the word, not one of you will be lost. And so both uh, non-canonical and canonical prophets or messengers of the Lord, their ministry is, as I said, to direct the people to the word of God. And so the purpose of the Bible in Ellen White's thinking is to help honest seekers to relate to the cosmic conflict in such a way that God's purpose to restore sinners will be achieved. And uh, it may lead them to an urgency in doing the work in the vineyard of the Lord. Now you understand that the works of the prophets, the prophets see things not the way we see them. There is always an urgency in their message, showing the shortness of the time. Many of the prophets, when you look at them, they do not push the events of the world history afar off. Uh, afar off. When they are in visions, when the spirit is working on them, when they are in dreams, when they are uh, writing what God is impressing on their minds, you will find them talking about the shortness of the time. But that does not mean that um, the messengers of the Lord are uh, alarmists because events pass on a high speed on their minds in their visions and they are shown future things in uh, a span of minutes or a span of seconds. And so their message seems a message of urgency. And that is the, the work of the prophets. And so just the way you wouldn't say Peter and Paul and the other prophets like Daniel and uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah were wrong when they when, when the, they wrote like the second coming will happen in their days or the first coming will happen in their days. So you cannot say that uh, uh, these non-canonical messengers or precisely E.G. White, uh, her, she was not inspired as they were inspired because she wrote in some urgency uh, that uh, things were going to happen and they have not happened until today. We better remember what Peter said, that the Lord is not slack in doing what he has said that he will do, but rather he did not, not delight in the death of the wicked. And so it seems that time has started so much, but then time has not started. God is waiting for all, us over, all of us to come into repentance and then uh, have a place in his kingdom. So within the Bible story, we find a built-in capacity for self-correction and understanding the Old Testament, understanding of God's plan for this world and how he will intervene and create a new world was clarified in later revelation in the New Testament. And things seem to be happening in rapid succession when you are reading the prophets, both canonical and non-canonical. And uh, just because things have tarried, then it should not lead some to be atheists and dispute about the Bible or some to reject E.G. White and her writings. Um, and uh, in conclusion, that uh, let us guide, uh, lead people back to the Bible. 
as we read her writings, as we read canonical and non-canonical writings, let us have this thing in mind that um, what we want to achieve is people to have a personal relationship. I continue saying personal relationship because we think once we are identified with a movement, then we are sealed and our names are recorded in the Bible. Our work with our different spiritual gifts are to guide the people back to the Bible. Both are, uh, uh, non-canonical and canonical uh, messengers of the Lord, their main work was to point people to Jesus. And more so with non-canonical uh, uh, messengers, their, uh, their, their, their task was to help people get their foot back in the Bible. And uh, nothing should be our creed but the Bible. Nothing should be our creed but the Bible. And when we do this, uh, we shall see our works uh, being accompanied by the Spirit of God and many things that have been disturbing us, many things that have been uh, giving us uh, a hard time will uh, actually uh, become lighter. Uh, I, I want to just... Um, read something in this closing. I want to read something in this clothing and closing and uh, this is what um, I want us to look at as we shall be going to the prophetic ministry of uh, uh, Ijiwa, the prophetic uh, uh, ministry of uh, E.G. White. This will be a very interesting uh, uh, topic, actually. Uh, the Bible says this in the book of uh, Matthew as our closing thought. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The reason why I wanted to read this verse is that I want us to go back to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask him to lead us. In these days when many things are happening and false prophets are rising, the Lord will arise through prophets. And we want just to bring our burdens unto him so that he may show us the light and we may not be deceived because he says that in the end time, false Christs and false prophets shall arise. If it were possible, they will even deceive the elect. And we don't want to be deceived either by E.G. White or by anyone. We want to know who is the true messenger of the Lord. But this only we can do when we cut our burden to the Lord. I believe that she was a true messenger of the Lord. And I believe her messages have helped me grow spiritually and in every way. But also, I don't want to impose anything on anyone. I just want to point everyone to Jesus Christ. And it should be the burden of everyone. And so much disputations will not guide our soul, soul's interest. But if we bring everything to the Lord in prayer, he will be able to show us. Both to understand the Bible, which is canonical, and both to show us the non-canonical messengers he is using and has been using in these last days. Otherwise, God bless us, and uh, may we continue praying for each other. As we see the day nearing, may we provoke each other unto love. And so may we pray us to bring this to an end. Our dear Father, again, thank you because of your love to us. And I just pray that uh, you may fill our hearts with thy spirit, Lord. 
the same mind that was in thy son that it may be in us. We may love each other deeply and we may have a burden for swinging souls from darkness. And so bless us and continue using us as vessels of honor in thy sanctuary. Mold us into thy own desired uh, vessels, Lord. And uh, above all, may we prefer one another and uh, may we show intimate love to one another, a love that cannot be broken. May you unite your church that it may do the purpose you put it on this earth to do. And may you, Lord, raise amongst us a people whom shall be used in the offices that you have said they shall be there until the end of the age. This is my prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again. Blessings and bye for now.